I am super excited to have been invited to speak and teach here at the International Photography Festival in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates. This is the Hall of Fame of photographers from around the world, world-class guys who are exhibiting and sharing their knowledge at this astonishing event. And I particularly would like you to meet this guy, Estra Suarez. He is a multiple Pulitzer Award-winning photojournalist. What he doesn't know about decisive moments and capturing breathtaking images in some of the most demanding and difficult situations is pretty much second to none. He's also a big bundle of fun and a great big kid. We have trouble staying on track because you know what I'm like. I'm going to nip over to the hotel, see if we can catch him because I'd love you guys to meet him. Why photography? What excited you about photography? First of all, guys, let me tell you, I'm supposed to be a serious, but looking at this guy's face, he just makes me smile. So this is not going to be a serious interview right off the bat. And he cute. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, get on with it. Okay. Yeah. So why, why photography? photography? Uh, so I was actually studying to be a writer, a journalist. And I grew up reading National Geographic. And uh, so I thought if I study journalism, specialize in magazine writing and get a minor in zoology because I happen to like animals, that would be the way to do it. So my, during my first semester of journalism classes, I was taking intro to journalism writing and my advisor was the same professor and I was struggling. Came from Panama, I learned English from a very young age, but the spoken language and the written language are two different things. And this uh, professor was so harsh that if you made a mistake, it was 50 points wow. off. So sometimes I would start my test and she'd be like, you owe me 50 points from the previous test. And I was like, so she knew I was struggling. So she said, why is it that you want to be a journalist again? And I told her, she's like, no. So she called me one day and she said, you know, Tom Kennedy, the director of photography for National Geographic back then, is alumnus of the college. He's coming to talk to photographers. You should talk to him. I'm like, no, I know nothing of photography. She's like, you're going. So she made me go. And I, you know, it was like eight photo students and I the only known photographer there. And so, but it turns out that because I had read so many geographics, I hit it off really well with him. So I finally said, so doing what I'm doing, studying journalism, magazine writing, zoology, do I have any chance of working for you guys? He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, okay. He's like, that's gonna be good for the ego. Oh yeah, so he goes, you have better chances you become a photographer. I'm like, okay, well, what do I do? He's like, what do you mean? He's like, how do I become a photographer? It's like. I don't know, you could apply for the internship. I'm like, when's the deadline? He said, December. It's September, I can do that. He's like, right. So I can draw a bit. So I went into the restaurant manager's office, I borrowed some paper, I drew a caricature of him. It was him sitting atop of the world, it says, as Rodin's thinker, and said, Tom Kennedy, National Geographic, the world is our backyard. I signed it, dated it, gave him the original, kept the copy, and I said, the next time you see that, my portfolio is going to be attached to it. He's like, right. He thought I was a crazy guy, and the other students were just kind of shaking their heads. So time goes, I get re I delve deep into photography. I never picked up a camera. We're talking now, I am a junior in college, so it's my, I, I might be 21, 21, 22 years old. And uh, it's the first time I pick up a camera. So I started learning all these things. I put a portfolio together. I do it on a, a wild, wildlife around the Gainesville, northern Florida area. And... Uh, December comes about, the same advisor sees me walk by her office. She's like, come here, I heard you've been working really hard on this portfolio. Is it ready? And he's like, yeah, it's ready. He's like, let me see it. So I bring it to him. He's like, oh, this is really good. So when are you going to send it? I'm like, you know what? The more I started learning about who this guy was and what the geographic photography is, I realized I should have never talked to him this way, that it was ludicrous. Uh, so I, I don't think I'm going to send it. So she's like, stop it. So she took it away. And that was the last I saw of that portfolio. In January... She calls me back into her office and she says, I got someone on the phone that wants to talk to you. So I pick up the phone and say, hey, Estras, this is Tom Kennedy from the National Geographic, photo director. I'm like, hold on a second. Look, what did you do? What did you, what did you, she said, talk to the man. So, you know, so I get, he's like, yes, Tom. He's like, look, you have a long way to go, but you have potential. I see potential in you. So I need someone who speaks Spanish. I need someone who knows about jungles and tropics. I need somebody who knows a bit about photography and a bit about animals. So he basically described me at that stage of my life. He says, and I can only pay you $50 a day. I'm like, you gonna pay me on top of this? So I spent two and a half months working in the jungles of Panama, Costa Rica, and Colombia. 
being an assistant to a couple of photographers. Once I had that experience, I was hooked. It's like, this is it. This is what I'm doing the rest of my life. Totally get it. But the thing is that what you did there is you kind of, by doing the cartoon and the caricature and going, the next time you see this, you stood out. And this is what you got to do. I'm doing it's, the English it's, thing. It's the, yeah, yeah, we're doing English. We're, we're being English. We're, we're, we're not drinking tea. We're drinking faux tea. Mm. <laughs> Delightful, old boy. <laughs> we're thinking of running a workshop together. I think you should come because it's going to be... Prepare your abs because you're going to laugh abs. so you're much. Gonna <laughs> prepare your abs, man. Okay, come on, get on with it. Pull it surprises. Talk okay. to us about your Pulitzer Prize, because that's so, a big time so, so thing. I have, I have, so I'm part of two Pulitzers, and uh, the first one was uh, Columbine, the Columbine shooting, which it's claimed to famous as the first big uh, massacre in the U.S., gun, yeah, yeah. gun violence, sadly not. Yeah. It's every weekend news now in the U.S., yeah. but it was the first one of its kind, and uh, out of that, there was 20 photos that were entered into a Pulitzer, and I have a photo that I'm sure he'll show you that it's a, a funeral. It's a funeral of one of the boys. It's a one African-American kid who had killed. And there were 3,000 people that came to view the, the body in a casket. And uh, I was, we were in a high platform up above. It was a big uh, mega church. And I was looking down. And out of the 3,000 people, at first when you get to a scene like that, you start photographing, photographing, because you don't know when they're gonna kick you out. But we had plenty of time, so I kind of calmed down, and after a bit, I started watching the crowd. And for some odd reason, I just focused on this one woman, I don't know why, young woman, and when she finally made it in front of the casket, I have the whole sequence of her with flowers in her hand, and she's overwhelmed with emotion, and she walks, and she, so I have her where you can see the face of the body, and then where the body's being blocked, and then walking away. So it turns out the, she had columbines, flowers in her hand. Hmm. And in the background, you could see the diploma that he was going to get if he would have graduated. So the editors picked that photo. So it's a powerful photo. Once you see it, you're, more, you're very likely not to forget it. So that photo means a lot to me. However, the second Pulitzer is just for having covered the Boston Marathon bombing. And mine was just one of many photos that were entered. And we just did a great job uh, covering the whole thing. So, but it's, it's, it's a great honor again, but to me the first one means more. I actually feel a little bit more gratified about something else called the Robert F. Kennedy mm. International Photography Award. By the way, I said that because I knew if he tried to say that, he was going to mess it up. <laughs> he got me trying to do it over break because he's going, what was the award? What was the award? Yeah. So it's known as the RFK. And uh, on that one, I follow the body of a, which is a story that's repeating itself again and again. This was like 20 years ago. A uh, young boy, 14-year-old, was being smuggled into the U.S. Mm -hmm. Once they cross the border, the, they get to a certain point in the U.S. and then they split up, go west, go east. When they were going through Colorado, the lonely road, middle of the night, the guy had been driving for 17 hours. Uh, all of a sudden, this spit of a long road, it's a sharp turn, and he just kept going straight. So the van overturned, 13 people inside, two of them died. So I was assigned by my editors to follow the body of a 14-year-old back to where it came from in the mountain of Guatemala. In the, so right on the border of Mexico. So I followed the body for three days. You know, it was a, a vigil in the, in the capital city of Guatemala City. And then a whole day of, we put the, the casket in the back of a pickup truck. We get, finally get to this little village, but the village was like an hour away. So we get to the last place we can drive. They tell the, the locals what's going on. The locals put the casket in, on their shoulders and they start hiking an hour up. And uh, I have this great photo in the essay where you see this big valley, you see the village on top, you see a, a pathway, and you see the line of the villagers, and on the foreground, you see the big white box and where they're carrying it. And people tell me, my God, you're so smart, you stayed behind to get that shot. No, I was exhausted. I had been going on for three days straight, and I was literally leaning against a tree, sick. My body was convulsing, and I could barely breathe because I was trying to keep up with them. And I just stopped, saw it in between, Heaving, I basically took the shot and then I ran and I caught up with him. But the, the, that photo of the essay is the one that you're going to see, which is of the, of the inside. They opened the box and the box, the casket was silver. So there's natural light coming in and the whole village is inside this little hut. And the light is just bouncing off their faces and the mother is there, the father is there. It's a very powerful image. So I have gotten lucky and I have been in the right spot at the right place uh, many, many times. And that plays a part, but also... <clears throat> we've been hanging out for a couple of days shooting stuff and we'll come to that in a minute but in those few days I kind of know you're quite an emotional character you care 
there's there's the popular idea of you know the hard nosed photojournalist who dives into someone's funeral, but you care you you care about the people about where you are. Yeah. How do you deal with those emotions and maybe those conflicts? So within you, I'm a true believer that the moment you stop caring is the moment you be, start becoming inefficient at doing your job. So I would say you were born a human being and you will die a human being. What, what you do in the middle, as your work, as your passion matters, but at the end you got to remember, you are dealing with human beings. Therefore, you should always walk in, in people's shoes. So I, I try to always approach the situation as if it were my scenario. What if that was my family's funeral, my relatives, and I have a perfect stranger coming in? Would I want him to stick a camera in my face or would I... Would I be okay with them being respectful about it? So I always try to be respectful about it. So I try to straddle that line. I have a duty to, to take this photo, to document the story, but I also have a duty to these people as respect as a human being, not to overstep my boundaries and make, make us a bad situation for them even worse. So that's just me. Mm. Other people have other approaches. Mm. And I mean, just on the subject of the hard-nosed photojournalist, guys, he's also a yoga teacher. Reconcile that. I've never seen a photographer Work with shades on, never mind gold ones. Talk to us about shades. Okay, so let's start with the shades part. I, I, I just wanted you to see because I think they're really cool and my wife is the one who got me into this mirror thing. So, but I, I'll take them off just out of respect. Um, so. You're an ass. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> so the thing is, the thing is, um, you know, I actually didn't know this, but I, a lot of my career has been spent working in the equatorial belt of the world. So I'm always under the sun, and every photographer can tell you that it's, it's a pain to work under the sun. And as a photojournalist, you don't have the luxury of showing up in the lightest, right? you got to work with what you got. So at some point, I, I picked up sunglasses, and I noticed that the sunglasses, if they were cheap, they're no good. So I actually, as a poor photographer, I went and bought a pair of Ray-Bans with glass, with polarized filter in them, and expensive. And I was really bummed out. I'm like, oh my God, this expensive glasses. Turns out that you can actually deduct them as a, as a tax deduction in the U.S. Because your eye, my eyes are the way I make money, therefore they are a tool for my job, just like my cameras are. And I just got used to it. And the whole, the fact that they're reflective, it just happens to be in vogue right now. But it's very good because it allows me to survey a scene. Something, there might be a photo over there that I want to take a photo of, and I might be able to just turn my eyes, see it if I'm wearing my glasses, and come back. And you've seen me do this. What I do is, if I want to take a photo of something going on over there, and the light is even, I might actually pick up my camera, do the reading, do the metering, do the, set, set the focal point where I know it's going to be, because the time I move here, I only have about a fraction of a second to get it right before people react to me. So I'm always trying to walk that line between doing the right thing, not being too surreptitious about taking photos, but also being honest with people so that the shades work. And I'm completely used to them. Mm. And this one specifically, they don't give you any distortion. They just actually just tone down the scene. So yeah, mm. that's why. Got it. Do you not find them kind of, they just get in the way? Not at all. With the eyepiece? Not I noticed you, because your camera has no, uh, you know, eye cup on it. And I'm yeah, guessing no. this is part of the reason. No, the part of the reason is because I always keep losing it. <laughs> you are I like me, aren't I you? I bought it at the beginning, yeah, yeah. and I'm like, where'd they go? I just didn't like for that. Most photographers, particularly street photographers, thrive on stealth. You know, they want to be stealthy. They, they hide behind things, use long lenses, and keep out of the way. You are not a stealthy guy. I'm not a stealthy guy. So I am... Um, Six feet tall, I weigh about 215 pounds. I put on big cameras on my shoulders. I, I have a big waist pack around my back, around my waist. And if the weather allows, I'd wear a scarf. Not only because it looks cool, and it does look cool, but it actually helps you like, with sweat. In your and mind. Some, in my mind. So yeah. <laughs> quickly, I, or it actually, you can clean the lenses in a, in a hurry. Here in Charge and Middle East, I haven't been able to wear a scarf. That would be just insane. It's too, too hot. But uh, so I cannot hide what I'm doing. So a long time ago, an editor of mine who was a, a mentor, his name is Dean Krakow, Zen of a photographer, he told me, Estress, you embrace the role of being a photographer too much. You will never be the fly on the wall. You need to work on that. I worked, tried working on it, but it didn't work. It didn't work. So I, I now do completely the opposite. I act the part. I am a big photographer with big personality out in the streets. And what I do is... I will take a photo. In my world, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than it is to ask for permission. I will take a photo, and then when people see me, I will stop, go to them, smile, introduce myself, tell them what I'm doing, show them the photo, and I might even offer them, would you like me to send me this photo to you? And most people just want to know what you're doing. Uh, I try not to hide, I, you know, because I said I cannot hide, and I truly believe that most people are okay with having their photo taken. 
That's not to say there are some people that don't like it, but you, you don't take I it personally. Completely agree. You I just completely move agree. On. Yeah. yeah. You move on. It's just a it. no. It doesn't mean anything personal doesn't, at yeah, all. If somebody yeah. doesn't like it, you just just move on. Um, what do you say your speciality is? My specialty is none. I am a generalist. The reason being is because having come from the world of newspaper photography, you are given an assignment and you have to fulfill it. You might not like the kind of photography that you have to do in that moment, which, for example, happened with me on, on food photography. Mm -hmm. When I moved to the Boston Globe from Denver, uh, they, they, Boston is a big foodie town, and it's, it, there are new restaurants popping up. So every week, that's like a column most, that is one of the most well-read, and where I was reviewing restaurants, and I would have to photograph food all the time. And at the beginning, I was no good at it. it was, I was embarrassingly bad. And finally, it dawned on me. I'm like, you know what? At the end of the day, my name goes by that photo, so I need to get good at it. So and I did. So if you were to look in my portfolio, estresmsuarez.photoshelter.com, we just look estres.com, estresmsuarez, uh, you would actually see there's a food category. And I'm really good at it. I just don't advertise it. But I, so I'm a generalist. I, I have complete <clears throat> domain of lights, artificial and natural light. I understand it really, really well. And I can do nature photography. I can do landscape architecture. The one thing I really don't like to photograph, it's sports photography. Mm -hmm. I can do it, but it's not my favorite thing to do. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I'm game. You point me in the right direction. I just got excited over some reflection and some pots over there on the, on the black tiles. We were walking around, we went shooting. And you know, we went down, we found the old ports and we were walking around and so, looking at stuff and the fish market. So I, I, told fish him, I told him I was scouting because I'm teaching here a two day street photography workshop. So before I take my students, I want to scout out the location just so I, I give them the most amount of options, the visual options. I don't want to take them to an empty place where there are no options because that doesn't work for them. So he said, can I tag along? I said, please come on down, the more the merrier. So we ended up in the fish market and uh, I, we did what we do, which is we started shooting. And it was an amazing real life scene and it was just full of color and the sound. God, I wish, I'm not a video guy, but I wish I would have gotten, you were getting the I guy. Got, we got the you, sound, you got we the got sound, the, right? Yeah, it's amazing. Course, yeah. you so you'll see some of those photos. And then we also play the tourist. You cannot come to this area of the world and don't go to the tallest building in the area. Mm. So we kind of did that. So there are all these people in this elevator that goes 124 floors in one minute. This thing is amazing. So you get it up there. It hurts your ears. It's yeah, worse it than going pops. up and down an aircraft. Right, right. It's, it's yeah. It's only without the G forces, you're not like being pulled mm. down. So so we get out. Yeah, it's it's a good view. Wow, amazing. Wow, look at all this. It's tall. And then all of a sudden, I'm like. Ooh, look at the floor, shiny floor. So next thing you know, he and I are working on the ground and we're taking, I actually like my photos of the reflections of people and what was going on there more than what I saw outside. And yeah. you ended up having fun. But there's always more to learn. There's, you know, and I've been saying actually for a year, I reckon some of these guys will have heard me say, I really want to go on a street photography workshop with someone who is a, a master of that genre. So it's really cool that we bumped into each other. But it's just like walking around, we were in the gift shop at the Berkeley, oh, yeah. the, the tower. Berkeley, and we're looking yeah. and, and there's a guy and he's kind of looking at, at the gifts. There's, figurines. There's, there's all these little figurines of the tower and it's almost like this guy was looking, trying to choose which one and they're all the same. But <laughs> he's kind of looking at them and I was saying, how do we get this shot? And can I like just, you know, do a shoot from the hip drive like, like this without disturbing him? Because then of course his body language changes. And this guy just kind of walked up and he goes, no, 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 you're doing this all wrong. And it was really cool because you just grabbed your phone. Go and you, you, you tell the guys your, your trip. So basically, so there's a man standing, there are all these figurines right here, and he's standing right here. And so as a photojournalist, you walk into a scene and you immediately have to take what I call your bubble of perspective, which is the way you see the world. You see the world through your eyes at eye level at all times. Therefore, if you present the brain with information the same way in a photo, the brain is like, Oh, I'm bored out of my mind. Why are you boring me? So you always got to think of new ways. So I immediately can take that bowl of perspective and I can throw in different places. I can right now picture how a photo would look if my camera were five feet up and pointing down. I know that'll be my, my big bald head, his white hair, his distinguished form, and then you would see the table and then the rest. So I actually knew right, of the, right away when the moment I saw him, the photo is not the man looking at the stuff. The photo is because it's their glass le levels with different figurines. You put, the, you put the, the phone below and you shoot up and he's actually looking at a bunch of figurines. And he came out a really cool photo. But I see the world that way. Wherever I walk into a room, I'm immediately looking at the possibilities. And it boils down to, I, I live by a world of deadlines all the time. Therefore, sometimes I would walk into a place I'd have five minutes to make a great photo because in 10, my editor needed it. 
So you just get used to thinking really, really fast. But what got me is like, so you reverse the camera, so you're onto the selfie camera, and then just rested it on the shelf at 45 degrees, so you can glance in. So you, you can, can kind of glance what what's doing. going on, and the phone is looking up. So yeah. it's, it's actually the principle of a periscope. Absolutely awesome. But also, of course, this touches on tool for the job. Oh, it's yeah. like you couldn't do that shot. No. With a big heavy DSLR. No, if I would have tried to put my big camera in between the figurines, they would have all fallen. They would on the floor. Everybody would have stopped what they were doing. And the photo would have been gone. I'd rather take a photo with less megapixels, but a great photo, and not ruin a scene that actually ruin a scene and not be able to take the photo. This is another thing, of course. I mean, a lot of people, certainly when they're starting out in photography, they're addicted to, oh, I can't go above 200 ISO. Means absolutely nothing. What were we shooting the other night when we were at the mosque? Uh, I don't know. 6,400, 3,200, somewhere around like that. that. Yeah. And the photos came out pretty good. Yeah, they did. They're, they're really content cool. really matters. Content to me is by far much more important than pixel size or anything like that. If your photos don't have good enough good content, I don't care how pretty your pixels are, that ain't working. This is the thing. We're looking at a photo, not a pixel. It's, yes, it's yes. a choice, isn't it? It's a great light and a great moment and a great emotion and a great experience with a bit of grain and a few pixels in it. Or beautiful, creamy, smooth pixels, but the whole thing's blurred and kind of yeah. out of focus, yeah, yeah. and it's not going to work. Estras, you're about to take a street photography workshop out, and I really wanted to join this man today, and I don't know if I can, because we're going to be out in the hot and the sweaty. I've got to get back, get showered, get changed. I'm running workshops all afternoon at Exposure, and I'm really You're bummed. hearing this, right? He's prissy. That's what this is all about. He needs to take a shower, he says. He doesn't want to buy it in the heat and then go inside. <laughs> Shut your face. <laughs> Man, it's a total good. pleasure. Give us a hug. Yeah, give us a hug, big man. Hey. I'm sure you'll be seeing more of this guy. I'm sure we're going to be doing some shit together. That's right. Maybe Ecuador? Rocket. Rocket. Put it there. See that? He left me hanging. I this left is, him hanging. This is, this is not rehearsed. This is the real Stop. deal. Stop. We'll go on forever. <laughs> okay. <laughs>